And, um, and our last speaker for the session is Yusuf Karler uh, from Institute of Experimental Physics, University of Innsbruck, Austria. And okay. um, he's going to talk about high fidelity by accident generation in gallium arsenide quantum dots. Okay, so can you yes. see my screen? And yes, it works excellent. Okay, Thanks. Everything perfect. Let me also adjust this. Okay. Okay, so I think I have participated in all COVID meetings, except the first one since 2017. I was just a bachelor student at that time, then I decided to go with quantum optics after the first COVID meeting. So I worked with Özgür Çakır and Quantronics starting from my bachelor's until the end of my master on the theory of quantum optics and information. But I should also express my gratitude to Serkan Ateş for introducing me to the experimental aspect of quantum op optics. Of course, I, I must thank all the organization and scientific committees since 2016 for this great meeting. Today, I will try to give a brief presentation about our last result. The title is High Fidelity by Exton Generation in Gallium Arsenide Quantum Dots by Chirp Picosecond Passes Through Adiabatic Rapid Passage. It's a very, very long title and a technical title. So first, I will speak about the motivation behind this title, then I will go into details more and more in every slide. Okay, so one can say that to realize quantum photonics, we need efficient fast photon counters to count the photons and photonic circuits to manipulate them. And of course, source of deterministic single photons, but only single photons can be used in some quantum technologies like the quantum K distribution. However, we need multi-photon states for multi-photon experiments like quantum computation, etc. But why? In 1987, three physicists have demonstrated two photon interference effect in quantum optics, which is known with their surnames, Hango Mandel effect. But it is not just two photon interference effect. It is two identical photon interference effect. When two identical single photons enter a 50-50 beam splitter and when the temporal overlap of the photons on the beam splitter is perfect, the two photons will always exit the beam splitter together in the same output mode. But how do we describe the term identical? Basically, if we have two photons, we can say that they are distinguishable or indistinguishable. If the photons have the same mode, we will see the interference effect, so they are indistinguishable. If the photons have different mode, so they are incoherent, so they do not interfere with each other. So to perform multi-photon experiment, we need indistinguishable bright single photon sources. We are currently working on a different multi-photon experiments. Of course, there is no enough time to discuss all the details, but I would like to show one example of photonic quantum computation, which is done by the multiplexic single photons, boson sampling, which is quite famous in the last years. Boson sampling is based on computing the output of a linear optical circuit that has multiple input and multiple outputs. Single and identical photons enter the circuit in parallel and interfere with each other due to the hongo mandel effect. And this is extremely difficult to use a classical computer to calculate output probabilities. Although I should say boson sampling experiment on photonics platforms are very difficult too, with lots of experimental challenges, I would say that the key point is to have near unity indistinguishable and bright single photon sources. So what, what are the choices? Spontaneous parametric down conversion sources, which are commonly used to generate single photons and entangled photon pairs. SPDC, I would call it SPDC. SPDC is a nonlinear optical process that converts one photon of higher energy, let's say blue photon, into a pair of photons of lower energy, let's say red photons. And their performance is quantified by their brightness, photon number purity, indistinguishability, and degree of entanglement. And all of them were improved over the years, and also they can perform in room temperature. That's a great advantage. But what are the limitations of SPDC sources? for quantum information processing. Multi-photon emission rate increases with the source brightness, so one should work with a very, very, very low rates. But another reason, and also the most important one, is the probabilistic nature of the SPDC sources. So they generate photon pairs non-deterministically. 
So there is a strong need for the on-demand generation of near unity indistinguishable single photon sources. On the other hand, despite of the experimental challenges, an ideal quantum light source would emit one and only one photon or photon pair per excitation cycle. There are several ways to access a quantum dot states, a bow band gap, quasi resonant and resonant excitation. A bow band gap excitation, which is based on sending energy more than the band gap energy of the hosting material. So this will create charge carriers and they will relax to the S shell of the quantum dyne and recombine with the host and emit a photon. Despite a bow band gap is a very practical way, we need resonant driving quantum dust to have high indistinguishable and bright single photon source. S shell resonance excitation gives the best result in terms of the photon indistinguishability. However, there is a big experimental challenge to realize resonant excitation. Laser light has the same wavelength with the emitted light, and the scattered laser light from the sample surface is also collected with the same objective that we excite and collect the quantum dot emission. And also cross-polarization technique will cost some of the quantum dot's emission due to the polarization selection on the emission path. Another resonant technique is two-photon resonant excitation. In this scheme, the laser has energy of the virtual state, which is half of the biextonic energy state. In two-photon excitation, we create two electrons and two holes in the S-shell. It is called biextonic state. So even there are two electron hole pairs in the S-shell, there is a difference in their energy. Biextonic energy is smaller than external energy because of the different strengths of the Coulomb interaction. In the spectrum on the right, two lines for the exciton and biexton, exton on the left and biexton on the right, can be seen with a wavelength difference of 1.9 nanometer. So this corresponds to approximately 3.7 mL electron volt binding energy. So thanks to this difference, we can see that the excitation laser is in the center, has different energy than both exciton and biexton. So we can filter the laser, especially without need of cross polarization. I will not go all the details of two photon excitation, but one can also achieve high polarization entanglement between exton and a biexton with a small fine structure splitting. So a very simple drawing of the experimental setup looks like this. So we prepare laser pulses. We send them to the cryostat from top and excite the quantum dot and then collect the quantum dot emission and scatter it light together and go to the, our homemade monochromator and send exton and biexton emissions to the SNSPD with a narrow band notch filters. Figure on the bottom shows the Rabi oscillations for the exton and biexton. Uh, there is a difference on the photon count, but it is just about the coupling efficiency differences between exton and biexton channel. In the spectrum, you can see that they have the they have the same same counts. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So excitation is the first step of generating single photons. Since we focus resonant excitation, there are some parameters of the laser pulses are critical to achieve a good resonance condition. On the left, you can see the, our detuning results. So the black spectrum in the center is the spectrum we achieve a good Rabi oscillations. Detuning is one of the extremely sensitive parameters. Even if we detune lasers slightly, like 0.1 nanometer, we are losing the Rabi oscillations. And also laser spectral width has, has some effect on the Rabi oscillation. And also we can see in the many papers, especially experimental physicists will understand me more, very low power of above band gap support is needed to suppress charge noises and the filling the traps in the sample. So if we do not apply some above band gap support, we might have some, some problem with the Rabi oscillations too. And depending on the experiments and the, or the component quality, there might be some power fluctuations of the excitation laser. But there is a way to compensate these effects and have a system which is less sensitive to excitation parameters. That is adiabatic rapid passage. So we can drive a quantum dot with a high chirp laser pulses to have a photon pair source that is insensitive to precise excitation power and detuning. So what does it mean chirping a laser pulse? When we chirp laser pulses, this corresponds to a quadratic phase profile in the frequency domain and you would have a temporal broadening in the time domain. 
Depending on the face profile which is applied, we can have no chirping, negative chirping, or positive chirping. And, and then when we drive quantum dust resonantly with chirp laser pulses, for example, a two photon resonant transition from ground state to the biaxonic state, the population of state becomes independent of the pulse energy. This is known as adiabatic rapid passage or rapid adiabatic passage. So this is how chirping setup looks on the table. The amount of the chirp is set by the distance between the grating and the second lens. If the second lens, sorry, <coughs> if the second grating is placed on the focal point of the second lens, there is no chirping effect. If it's placed after the focal point, there is a negative chirp, and if it's placed before the focal point, there is a positive chirp. So we designed a folded version of the chirper so we can achieve high chirp values by just moving one stage you can see at the right bottom on the and the right top. So in this work, we use two picosecond laser pulses and chirping picosecond pulses is not easy since the amount of chirp needs to put for a significant increase in pulse duration is huge compared to when you have femtosecond laser pulses. So conventional chirping techniques by adding a quadratic phase like SLM is not easy. For example, we moved this all stage approximately 85, 90 centimeter to introduce a chirp of 20 picoseconds square. This chirp would be impossible to add by an SLM. If we come to the experimental results, we can say that a quantum dot which is driven at a high chirp can be considered as a photon pair source that is insensitive to precise excitation power. On the left top, you can see our three level system simulation without phonons at the zero Kelvin and the experimental results, which, is like, which are taken at four Kelvin. The X axis shows of the simulation, X axis shows, X -axis shows the excitation power and Y axis shows to the applied chirp values and the Z axis color shows to by extant population. So when we go high chirper, but uh, for example, if you look at the zero chirp value, it is like if we cut from the center, like the zero line on the center, we see a full period of rabi oscillation in the simulation and also, yeah, a good rabi oscillation in the experimental result. But when we go higher chirp, uh, when we go higher positive chirp values, we see vanishing of rabi oscillation and there's a saturation of biaxone population. Experiments results for positive chirp values are very similar to our simulation but not for the negative chirp values because our simulation is very ideal, simple, and it is symmetric for negative chirp values. So, so sorry, yes. I, I need to ask a question because uh, there are different colors on the uh, experiment results. For, for example, green, sorry, blue, green, red, yes. purple. Like, so, so where they do correspond? Here, just for example, I just cut a square from the simulation and this, the first line, blue line is the center, the zero chirp values. And the, like, the, like, like the black one is at the top, 20 picosecond, approximately it's, it's written like 14 picosecond square, the black line. In the simulation, it corresponds to the 14 line here. You don't see my mouse probably, I need to go other screen. Do you see my mouse? And the blue line corresponds to this cut of the simulation and the like black one approximately 14 picoseconds square is approximately somewhere here. Okay, I see. Okay. <coughs> so I was saying uh, the experiment results for positive chirp values, okay, are very similar to our simulation, but not for the negative chirp values because the simulation that we did is very ideal. And it is symmetric for negative chirp values when there is no phonon. But of course, there are phonons in our experiment because we are working on four Kelvin. But if you look at the simulation on the right top, which is done by Martin Ax group on the right top, and if the temperature is four Kelvin, population of biaxon for high negative chirp values is different than the positive one. It might be confusing here because uh, the axes are different. Here, the x-axis shows the chirping values and the y-axis shows the power values. Actually, I should have corrected my image with the same orientation, but I always forget. Uh, so it might be confusing because of that, but it's the same, just like tilted, like, like rotated 90 degree. And if you look at uh, our experimental res 
a result which is done by 8 Kelvin for negative chirp values in the bottom. We can see the negative chirp values which increases from left to right, high chirp values, and the rabi oscillations are vanishing and the population of biaxton is decreasing after reaching some value as seen in the Martinax simulation. Adiabatic rapid passage helps us to avoid not only power fluctuation of the excitation laser, but also helps us to compensate slight detuning effect. Even the excitation laser is not resonant perfectly, there is a region with a high chirp and high power that we can still achieve maximum population of biaxton. Here in the simulation result with slightly detuning laser pulses, we, we did, and in the bottom there is a, this, uh, like, we started in the first figure of the Rabi experiment with a non-perfect resonance condition. When we go to higher chirp values, we can see vanishing of Rabi oscillation and achieve a maximum population of biaxton. So now we are currently preparing a paper. So we are improving the simulation and the chirping system and repeating experiment with different temperature like 4 Kelvin and 1.5 Kelvin with the closed cycle cryostat, also with different quantum dust and also with different detunings. And of course, uh, like nothing will be possible without a semiconductor quantum dot samples. The samples we use are grown by Armando Rastelli group from Johannes Kepler University, Linz. So the quantum dots are grown by molecular beam epitaxion gallium arsenide substrate. A sketch of the process is given in the figure on the top. So, so the matrix is made of aluminum gallium arsenides and Aluminum deposition creates nanoholes, and those holes are filled with the gallium arsenide, then it's capped with a top barrier of another aluminum gallium arsenide. Compared to band gap of the matrix material, aluminum gallium arsenide, which is approximately 1.9 electron volt in the room temperature, at room temperature, and the gallium arsenide fillings has a band gap of only 1.4 electron volt at the room temperature. So uh, this creates some three-dimensional confinement, and we have a quantum dot. So uh, these quantum dots are good be in th that density. They are not very bright because this, uh, like epitaxial grown quantum dots are embedded in semiconductor materials. So total internal reflection of the emitted light at the semiconductor air interface yeah, may lead to us less than 1% extraction efficiency, even with a high numerical aperture optics. But using distributed Bragg reflectors like DBRs and solid immersed lens on top of the surface, uh, we could increase extraction efficiency approximately 10%. However, now we are also working some different hybrid sample structure with the collaboration Armando Rastelli group and some bull size grating nano rings like Luca Sapienza did in the last years to improve extraction efficiency and have a good collimated laser light source for this uh, multi-photon experiments. Of course, I'm presenting here, but uh, that's a team job from sample growing to simulation to data analysis. So we are almost working together in all the steps and all the time with my colleagues in this project, Dr. Vikas Ramesh and my colleague Florian Kape. And this is also our team from Photonics Group, University of Innsbruck. Thank you. I hope I could catch the time. Yes, this was excellent. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you very much for this quite interesting talk. Um, and I know we are late, but I think we still maybe have a few questions. Um, anyone from the hmm. Let me look at the chat also, because I don't see the uh, chat screen. We don't have a question. Okay, now I see chat. the chat screen. Uh, we don't have a question, okay. I guess, on the chat right now. Um, I don't see anyone. Hand. Um, so do you know? So is so what? How do you, do they then control the growth this gallium arsenides for you? Gallium arsenide quantum dots. Yes, actually they are very small and symmetric, so they have very small fan structures splitting, like two, three yeah. micro electron volts. So they are very, very, very good candidate for entanglement based quantum K distribution. Mm -hmm. So also they published a paper in the last year about this topic. Yeah. But yeah, they are not super bright because if you use some nanowires, some nano pillars, you can achieve like the millions of photons in the in the detector. But we could achieve maximum four or five hundred kilohertz photon in the SNSPD with these DBR structures. 
But the whole idea of this adiabatic rapid passage have a very good and robust excitation conditions and, and make the system independent of the excitation fluctuations like detuning and the power fluctuations yeah. for multi-photon experiments. I, I have my, one more primitive question, but anyone has questions? I can see the floor. Nope. I guess no. Yeah. So can you control the, excite, the uh, emission from bioexciton then to exciton, like on demand? Like can yes. you see? Okay. So that, that uh, was... Mm -hmm. We know the lifetimes. Lifetimes are approximately 200 and 250 picosecond without any kind of photonic cavity. But we can yeah. increase, we can apply some per cell enhancement with this, some like bullseye size cavity, and we can go less than 100, 100, 100 picosecond lifetimes. And, yeah. it, and it's the cascaded emission. So, first, by like first two electron holes, and first one of them should recombine. And, and we know where the like when the second will come. Also, we have some idea to use this a bioexton as a heralding photon, like as PDC sources. So, because we can use a bioexton as a heralding photon, and we know exactly there is an exciton just after the bioexton recombination. Again, that, that, that I think I will ask this one last question, and then maybe we can. Of course. So, do you think we can like control this bioexciton to exciton? by just using the polarization of the light? No? Uh, in, this, in this quantum dust, the light polarization of the emission is uh, circular completely. And it's circular. I should, hmm. Yeah, okay. I, should, I, should, okay. I should also have some image. Okay, in here, like you can see, this is a, this is a, there's a half-wave plate and polarizer okay, for right the spectrometer. So the laser is strongly linear, but the quantum dust emission is uh, yeah, I would say almost circle. Okay, because if you would do that, I was gonna suggest some another idea, but now I should stop. I guess. Okay. Yes. Like, Thank you very much. We can. Yusuf. We can. We can just like discuss in the getter. Yeah. Time. Excellent. Thank you very much, Yusuf, once more for the talk. Thank you. Have a nice day.